The following is a WYMT-TV news production of the May 9, 1988 tornado, which touched down in Middlesbrough and Bell County, killing one person, injuring several, and causing millions of dollars in damages. They come through about 10.30 just all one time. All the trees blew over, light poles went over, flash flying everywhere. Worst that I can ever remember. And I've been here practically all my life, and I've never seen anything like this in my life. But there was no warnings for this area. So this, this tornado hit without any warning whatsoever. We had no warning whatsoever for the National Weather Service. Many of the residents of Middlesbrough and southeastern Kentucky were preparing for the night when the tornado struck shortly after 10.30. Windows were blown out of storefronts, utility lines were down, and through the darkness, remnants of the twister could be seen. The winds they started hailing for about 30 seconds or a minute, and uh, after that happened, it just, the wind started blowing everywhere, and you saw two fours and everything going everywhere, roofs blowing off, and it, it started down. We went out looking around, and it looked like it came down Cumberland Avenue and tore some trailers up, and then come on down this way. Was, was it a twister, or was it uh, well, high you, winds? or what? It just high winds. I never did see a twister. Yeah. A lot of glass broke, trees pulled up. Mess, total mess. Catastrophe. I don't, all the damage that was going on around us, I don't know how in the world we got out of there alive. Well, thank God it happened at night, or if we'd had so many people downtown, you know, there have been a lot of people killed, probably. Immediately after the tornado, word spread quickly. Radio stations WMIK and WFXY began an around-the-clock broadcast. WFXY studios had become a target of high winds. Sure, it was going to destroy the building. In fact, it did destroy two next door to us, so it was very close. National Guard troops were called in to assist in keeping order in the city and to watch for possible looters until daylight could arrive. The morning sunshine brought only a brutal reminder of what some may have wished was a nightmare. Although the local hospitals had been busy treating several injuries, the only fatality of the disaster occurred here, at the home of 35-year-old Linda Cosby. Cosby's life had been taken when high winds destroyed her mobile home. The woman's 11-year-old son was also severely injured. Disaster crews immediately began surveying the situation. Trying to get all this mess out of the way and trying to get power restored in some of the storefronts where they can uh, get the buildings in some sort of shape. We've got trees down all over town. That's it's blocking the traffic and uh, it's causing a variety of messes. That's the first step we're going to take in, in anything. The highest concentrations are uh, in a path approximately four, four blocks wide and uh, it intensifies um, starting in the west and heading east right down Cumberland Avenue, right down the main street of Middlesboro. Enter Governor Wilkinson into the picture. Wilkinson had been made aware of the disaster by Mayor Troy Welch and decided to visit the city the day after. The governor's visit was a short one, but he expressed praise for cleanup operations which were underway. But the transportation cabinet's down here with all the equipment, and the DES people are here, and the Guard is here, and military affairs is here, and the emergency medical service people have done a good job, all the local officials, uh, the city police, and uh, uh, everybody just done a marvelous job. So as far as I can tell, there's uh, at the moment very little left to do except get the utilities back on this afternoon, which they believe will happen, and find places for uh, people to stay uh, tonight, uh, people that have lost their homes and apartments. So I am very, very, very pleased with the way the situation has been handled and from everything I can see is just a superb job has been done by all. Wilkinson's initial visit also held some upsetting news for many of the townsfolk. 
Well, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm happy to see you again, yeah, not under these circumstances, but... Uh... In hopes of receiving federal assistance, words from the governor were not encouraging. Hello. Plan to ask for any federal assistance? No, the opinion at the moment is is that it's not uh, of sufficient, the damage is not of sufficient magnitude to qualify for federal aid, plus the fact that 90-95% uh, they tell me of the damage is covered by insurance. So it is probably not severe enough uh, to be declared a federal disaster. Wilkinson would later say he was misinterpreted by the press concerning federal assistance, but regardless, his words had a stinging effect. And the thoughts that federal assistance would not be considered brought reaction. Well, it, just, it just shocked me, really. He should have, when he first drove down, he should have and seen all the, what happened in town, downtown Middlesbrough. He should have declared a disaster. Because the, most of the buildings in town are cracked. The, the frames of the buildings are cracked on the outside. You can look at them and how, when you uh, look at the bricks. They're just like they're straight. They were just all crumbled. We did have a disaster. We do have emergency uh, conditions here, and we need help from the state and federal government in this. There's so many things that uh, that's hidden from the eye that you can't see. So many damages and that you can't see, and that's what we're doing here right now, setting up committees. There's so many things that uh, uh, that they're not figuring on that. On down the road, maybe a year from now, we'll find out if we don't do these things right at the present time. Those are the things that we want to show him. And show him indeed. Through Mayor Welch and other city and county officials, Wilkinson agreed the very next day to return to Middlesbrough, this time making a thorough inspection of the disaster and the city. This time, he was met by citizens determined to bend an ear. It is a tragedy. A life has been lost. And, uh, could have been more. They could have been killed, too. I, I made, I made the statement, let's be thankful. Thank God. I thank God for what we've got. Yeah, that, they need the help. That more people, more lives were lost. We can be thankful for that. But it is a disaster. And your mayor, your judge, and I, as well as your senators and, and, and your congressmen, we've talked to every one of them this morning. Everyone is doing every imaginable thing. We'll move heaven and earth. To get every dime if you need any help, all the people I'm sure is going to help you. I know you will. His initial assessment was that, you know, in comparison to other disasters, you know, that, that there, there wasn't, you know, several counties affected and, and the federal government being what in the financial state it's in right now, a disaster declaration didn't necessarily, he couldn't walk in and say, yes, there'll be one. Like in 1977, the governor could take a look at southeastern Kentucky and tell you pretty much, you know, we have a disaster here that will be declared. In this instance, it's taken a lot more assessment. Uh, the phase we're into now is exactly that. Uh, we've got to get some hard dollar figures to give to the governor and to the uh, Congressman Rogers and other people that are going to go uh, to Washington with these figures and try to get some federal money. Well, let's all pray for him. That's all we knew. Were you disappointed with his initial proclamation in regard to the damage assessment? And yeah, yesterday, what I just what I heard, you know, hearsay was pretty sad. You know, it's like he didn't really think it was anything. So, what do you think now that you've had a chance to talk to him? Well, what we discussed here just then was just nothing really. You know, it'll be next week before they decide whether they're going to do anything. So you're not real pleased or impressed or anything? Well, he just made a token visit. <laughs> That's about all it was. Are you, about today or the other day? Today. Are you glad that they're uh, planning to open a disaster office? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's stepping right, Rachel. Uh, 
application. Wilkinson's last visit brought a renewed hope for the tornado victims. The governor this time met with the residents face to face and pledged his support. I am issuing today an executive order declaring Middlesboro as a state disaster area. And, and we are going to request a presidential major disaster declaration with all of the appropriate maximum assistance. Do not be alarmed if you see numbers on the damage report and do not be alarmed if, if, if somebody says, well, the damage is far greater than that. This application has to go in. And these are preliminary estimates, just like the preliminary estimates that we had early on. And it's much more severe than those preliminary estimates thought. And I'm sure it's much more severe than we think today. How do you feel about the situation now that the governor has uh, declared a disaster area? A lot better. A lot more encouraged about it. What do you think will come of it now? I have no idea. I've never been in a situation like this, but my sister was in it, and that's the reason we're here. My sister is in the hospital at Pineville. She was injured really bad. <coughs> Excuse me, really bad when her trailer exploded. So I guess this really makes you feel good about uh, her right now, doesn't it? Yes, yes. All, all I want to do right now is help. Well, we didn't think you cared enough to come back, and we really appreciate you coming back and taking a second look and seeing all the devastation that happened. We really appreciate that. Thank you on part of my family. Obviously, yes. I'm, I'm very happy. I, I understand now what he was uh, talking about, that it uh, could have led to hysteria money, everyone filing claims when they actually didn't understand and didn't know the procedures to follow and didn't really and truly know what their damages are. Structurally, it might take more than just a visual look, a first visual look to, um, to, to assess the damage and, you know, once they get people in to really look and see what was going on and see what damage was done, maybe get some professionals to look and that obviously, you know, couldn't have been done that first day. What do you think the general reaction is here now? Oh, I think it's very, a uh, very positive reaction. The uh, governor um, obviously did what the people wanted to do and uh, the right thing to do. He did the, the right thing to do and what the people wanted him and needed it. It needed to be done. The, uh, the damage initially couldn't have been, couldn't have been seen. I think after they got the stuff cleaned up and he could see, you know, he could see, like he got all the trees cleaned up and he could walk around looking at the buildings and stuff like that and seeing the structural damage, that helped out a lot because you couldn't tell at first what, how much damage was done. I mean, a lot of wind has been blown out and stuff, but now that it's been cleaned up, you can see where it's made cracks in all the buildings and stuff like that. I just told the governor in person that I want to commend him because I was pretty harsh yesterday in an interview and today because I didn't think he really Really cared enough to come back and I really want to commend him on parts of my family and all the families that lost anything and say that we really appreciate his caring enough to come back and take a second look. We all really want to thank him for that. Do you think the the uh, attitude here coming back and declaring a disaster, disaster area after yesterday, do you think uh, the opinion and attitudes toward Governor Wilkinson have changed maybe within a twinkling of an eye? Well, I think if he does what he says and, you know, they see some action, yes, I, I don't think it's going to change everybody's attitude, but I think that people will appreciate him for the fact that he has done what he said he would do and that, you know, he can't give them back what they've lost. Nobody can do that because most of them lost everything. Some of them even lost, a fa you know, one of them even lost a family member. You can't give them back that, but at least if he helps them to rebuild, to get a start again, that all of them deserve then I think that maybe they'll, they'll look at him and say, okay, maybe we ought to take a second look at the man and think about it. And I think that's all he can ask. Disaster assistant agencies had been summoned into the southeastern Kentucky town, and while federal assistance money was on hold, help from other areas was being made available. If uh, the president uh, doesn't uh, declare Middlesboro a disaster area, there are still a lot of services that can be provided to the people of Middlesboro uh, through normal channels, uh, the federal government. Uh, we've had a lot of people that's had home losses. We've had businesses that have lost, uh, in the uh, folks that have lost their homes, their potential help through the Farmers Home Administration who makes farm loans that uh, 
and home loans through uh, with sm low interest loans. Uh, we've got the Small Business Administration that uh, we could uh, bring in even through normal channels that could help some of these folks out. Uh, uh, we hope to uh, get the Federal Aviation Administration in here to look at the airport to see what can be done there. Uh, there are numerous services that the federal government has in place uh, to assist people that uh, are having problems and uh, uh, we will uh, try to uh, get the people of Middlesbrough to uh, together and let them know what these services are and uh, we will try to expedite them once they have applied for these services through the federal government through normal channels. In a moment we'll look at how Middlesbrough residents were caught off guard with little if no warning of a tornado and we'll receive some tips of possibly how to avoid a similar situation in the future. The topic of conversation throughout the state was, of course, the Middlesbrough tornado and why there was little warning of the disaster. Reporter Bill Bryant, host of a Lexington television talk show, Heart of the Matter, concentrated his program on the situation. Good afternoon to you. Middlesboro is quite different from the way it was this time last weekend. Much of its downtown is in ruins, its homes damaged, its direction changed, and its people drawn closer together. We'll be joined by the director of the National Weather Service office in Jackson, who was on duty when the surprise tornado ripped through Middlesboro. We'll also be talking with a disaster and emergency services official who tells us how you handle such a scene. But first, meteorologist Tom Burse on the killer storm. The Middlesboro tornado came plowing over the mountaintop Monday night without warning. In its path, death and destruction. A 35-year-old woman was killed, 16 others hurt. The violent winds also heavily damaged 38 businesses and 24 homes. Planes were twisted and flipped over at Middlesboro Airport. 142 homes received some damage, along with 82 businesses, two churches, a school and a hospital. Tornadoes are very unpredictable. Throughout the evening, the Weather Service had issued severe weather statements for parts of Kentucky. Middlesboro was not under a tornado watch, but a tornado watch had been issued for other parts of Kentucky, and radar indicated some storms in southeastern Kentucky. Tom, you used the word unpredictable, and I think <laughs> that you really meant that. That's probably the biggest word you can use when talking about tornadoes. Now, we had watches out for parts of the state that night, but not the far southern part of the state. Do you think people sometimes uh, think that if they're two miles outside the line <laughs> covered by a watch or warning that they don't have anything to worry about? Well, unfortunately, I've heard that being, you know, as an excuse before in a lot of cases over the years. Um, when you're talking about the atmosphere, you can't make distinct boundaries. Now... The National Severe Storms Forecast Center in Kansas City, when they put together a thunderstorm or a tornado watch area, they have to draw guidelines somewhere based on the meteorological factors. And in this case, the probabilities were not that high for the southern end of the state that there would be a tornado. That does not eliminate the factor, though. Very quickly, just a, another primer on watch and warning. What is the difference if people still want Well, a watch thing? means that conditions are favorable for that kind of storm formation. A warning is just that. They're warning you that it, the tornado or the thunderstorm is occurring or is very likely to occur very soon. Now, what we had, I think, that evening was a severe thunderstorm watch in, in many parts of the state. What is that? We actually had two things going that night, a tornado watch and a severe thunderstorm watch. That means that the atmospheric conditions were favorable for thunderstorms, severe thunderstorms, or tornadoes in either particular case to occur with most of the activity should have been more to the north. Mm -hmm. But any time you get a severe thunderstorm, you always have a possibility of a tornado coming out of that, it, right. even if there's a, not a watch. Okay. Tom, I invite you to stay with me as we question and go right now to director of our Mountain Affiliate WYMT-TV in Hazard. And Gil Russell is the director of the National Weather Service office in Jackson. Hello, uh, Mr. Russell. Good morning, Bill. I, I just uh, want to know, I guess the basic question, a lot of people ask this question, and maybe it's too simplified, and, and that is just simply, why was there no warning on that, that night in Middlesboro? Well, quite frankly, uh, we just didn't know it was there. Uh, we mm -hmm. did have a thunderstorm on radar, in which we had analyzed, in our opinion, very thoroughly, 
and it just gave us none of what we call the classic uh, severe weather signatures. We had no indication whatsoever from our vantage point that that, uh, that, that storm uh, would produce a tornado. Do you think people expect uh, too much out of the weather service? I think sometimes they do. Uh, uh, they have the idea that uh, we can predict these things and, uh, and we just can't. In most cases, I'd say in nearly every case, the first we know of a tornado is when uh, somebody reports it to us, such as a severe weather spotter, a state policeman, or somebody in the area. Now, we can identify, in most cases, the possibility of severe storms, and as Tom just pointed out, any severe thunderstorm uh, has the possibility of producing a tornado. It's been pointed out to me that there is a such thing as a, a new Doppler radar system that uh, is, uh, does a better job of spotting severe weather. Is that true, and uh, if so, why don't we have that? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, the radar we have now at the Jackson Weather Office is primarily uh, measures precipitation. It measures the intensity of the precipitation in the thunderstorm. There's other things that we can get from the radar that will give us an idea of whether or not it's a severe storm. The Doppler radar uh, the National Weather Service is currently undergoing a reorganization and modernization, mm -hmm. and most weather offices, uh, say within the next four to five years, will have the Doppler radar. It's much more sensitive to wind currents than the present precipitation type measuring radar that we have. And uh, we think we'll be able to, uh, at least in some cases, more positively identify possibility of tornadoes and thunderstorms when we get the Doppler radar operational. Gil, I've lived in various parts of the country, from the plains down to Mississippi. And in the plains, if a tornado develops, out from a populated area, a lot of times you can see it coming. That's not a problem. In Mississippi, it was a problem because it gets lost in rain or in trees. How does that relate to what happened in southeastern Kentucky the other night? Is there a problem with visually seeing tornadoes down there? Well, in this particular storm in Middlesbrough, of course, it was, uh, it was late at night. Uh, they're always hard to identify at night unless they're in a populated area where there's a lot of electrical power lines that are torn down and you can see the uh, reflection from the, uh, the, the electrical disturbances. Uh, also, the mountains in this area uh, help to obscure them, along with, of course, the rain and so forth. Okay, we do have a satellite picture, if we can pull that up, and it's from 10 p.m. that night, and it shows a large cell down in the southeastern corner of the state, and there's the radar picture from a little while afterwards. If you can see that, you can see quite a bit of heavy thunderstorm activity going on. We also have a satellite close-up from that area from 10 p.m. If you can see that, can you describe what's going on down there that you can see? Well, what we're looking at now is a very large storm cell down around the Middlesbrough area uh -huh. at area 10 p.m. And uh, we do have a lot of drying air coming in behind that, and that is very indicative of very heavy thunderstorms. Uh, can you give us a little indication what that dry air actually does to that air ahead of it uh, as far as uh, kicking off thunderstorms and the possibility of tornadoes? Uh, the satellite, uh, of course, at the Jackson Weather Office, we don't have access to the satellite picture. We did get some of that indication a little bit later. And uh, I re at this point, I really can't... Are you showing the... Uh, not not yeah, right you're now. You're probably not able to see it there. Well, one of the problems with thunderstorms across Kentucky and a lot of places in this part of the country is that when they start popping up on a hot afternoon or a muggy evening, it's just a matter of minutes sometimes before they get to levels that can be very heavy or severe. Yes. How quickly can that change take place, Gil? Well, thunderstorms can build from what we call a, uh, a level one or a level two, which is just a minor, what we call a garden variety thunderstorm, which you might get some thunder and some lightning out of it, uh, up into uh, level five or six, which is, indicates a severe thunderstorm, sometimes within 15 to 20 minutes or even quicker, very, very quickly. I understand you've been with the Weather Service uh, for quite a number of years. Have you seen the accuracy improve over the years? I think the accuracy of our general forecast uh, has improved considerably over the 30-some years that I've been in the, uh, in the weather service as far as uh, generalized forecasting for one, two to three days and even extended outlooks. I think as far as being able to pinpoint uh, severe weather with the technology that we have available to the weather service right now, uh, it's improved uh, somewhat. Of course, several years ago, we didn't even have the radar. That's relatively new. It's, since World War II anyway, but uh, I think that's improved as far as identifying severe thunderstorms, identifying the general area which they're going to move through. But as far as able to identify tornadoes uh, very far in advance before they're actually reported to us, 
and being able to pinpoint the exact movement of these storms, uh, we're still not able to do that. A lot of times folks ask how the coming spring season is going to be as far as tornado activity, and there's just no way to tell because it's even very hard to tell on the short scale. One thing to remember, though, is any time there's a severe thunderstorm, that a severe thunder thunderstorm can always spawn a tornado. So we need to be weather alert. And also the National Weather Service radio is a good thing to have in the house. Yes, that's correct. Let me ask you this, uh, just in closing, uh, Gil, of course, everybody's surprised by what uh, happened down in Middlesboro. Our community is uh, pretty well prepared, do you think, uh, uh, to take action when, in fact, a watcher warning is issued? Uh, well, Bill, no, I don't, uh, don't really think they are. I think, uh, especially in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, uh, there seems to be a considerable apathy as far as tornadoes and severe thunderstorms are concerned. Now, if we mention flash floods or flooding over here, we get people's attention, but there seems to be a, a, an attitude that uh, the mountains uh, will protect them from thunderstorms and, and tornado activity. I hear that comment all over southeast Kentucky that we don't get tornadoes over here yeah. because, uh, because the mountains will protect us, and that just isn't necessarily true. Is there any accuracy at all to that? Uh, not in my opinion, no. All right. You know, thank you very much for uh, joining us today from our Mountain Affiliate WYMT-TV in Hazard. We're going to take a break right here, and in just a moment we will meet a disaster and emergency services official who tells us now the job ahead for Middlesboro. We'll be right back. And we welcome you right back into Heart of the Matter now as we talk about this disastrous tornado that ripped through Middlesboro earlier in the week and what's ahead for that city and for others who are prepared or not prepared for the same kind of situation that could occur. Tom Little is joining us now. He's the Director of Operations for the Disaster and Emergency Services Branch of State Government. Tom, I think the first thing that, that uh, what we were talking to Gil a little bit about, and that is the, the, the warning or the ability to warn, uh, was Middlesboro prepared to warn its citizenry about this and are most communities in Kentucky ready? I think it would be very unusual to find many communities at all that are well prepared to warn the public. It's probably the most difficult task in emergency services to get timely warning to the community. There are some that are doing a good job and are working hard to make the situation better. But the situation in this particular case where it occurred late at night uh, in Middlesboro is does not have an adequate outdoor warning system and frankly that wouldn't have made much difference at that time of night. Uh, during our statewide warning test in March they did not have a nor weather radar receiver for example in their 24-hour warning point. Um, the ability to warn John Q citizen is very difficult everywhere and in eastern Kentucky because the train and the rather weak coverage of the weather radio system it's even more difficult. And uh, what about uh, other ways of warning the public, commercial radio, sirens, uh, this, this kind of thing? There are several ways. Uh, one of the best ways is cable override because so many television, uh, so many people have cable television these days. and There are rather inexpensive systems that allow a system to override every channel. And more and more communities are becoming aware of this and are becoming uh, involved in working with their uh, cable providers to provide that service. Uh, the emergency broadcast system that's operated by the National or by the Kentucky Broadcasters Association is pretty effective. Uh, although, again, in eastern Kentucky, it's it's not very effective because it's all FM. They don't have many stations on after dark, and coverage is very limited. Uh, the the best solution in most communities is individual National Weather Service radios. Uh, that's limited in eastern Kentucky, but it is still probably the most reliable. Limited in terms of there are areas that could not possibly receive a signal. Right. There are areas that are what we call dead in this system. Uh, we have been with, with Paul Warnicke, who's the Director of Telecommunications for State Government, lobbying the Weather Service and the Congress for a number of years to try to fill in those holes. But it's a very costly process, and the budget simply haven't allowed for that. Something I take uh, doesn't please you. <clears throat> you always wonder why money isn't available when it obviously has a direct impact on saving lives. Um, but there are other demands, there are other, there are other people, and there are not many people out there lobbying for money for warning systems. Uh, there's, there's not a client group that's demanding every day to have those priorities put in budgets. On the scale of things, how big is this uh, disaster down in Middlesboro? What's, what's this, is, this has really been quite substantial. It's certainly the most significant disaster that Kentucky has faced in any type since 1984 when we had some flooding. Um, 
I guess it's, it's perhaps even greater because Middlesbrough is a fairly small community. Uh, this ripped right through the middle of it. Uh, everyone just about was impacted in some way, either through their home or someone they know was, uh, was injured, or uh, we, and we had one death, of course, um, or where the, the place of work was damaged, the place where they shop was damaged. Everybody's been touched, so it's a very significant event. Uh, the dollars and cents are really hard to determine. Uh, and it's been very, very difficult to determine the, really the extent of insurance as well because some of the facilities were insured for replacement value, some for resale value, some underinsured, some not insured at all. So the, the actual dollars and cents lost to the community probably won't be known for some time. And if you're directly affected by what happened through some destruction in your house or a car or something like that, you have a totally different perspective on it than what we may write here. Now, the storm came down just west of town. And what would be the possibility of, even if someone had seen the tornado, to actually get the word out in time? In that community, and in fact in most communities, given the speed of the tornado, it's very unlikely that it would have made a much difference. Uh, perhaps the people on the east end of town, the east end of Cumberland Avenue, may have had enough time to get to a basement uh, or to a sheltered area. But in terms of the damage that, that occurred downtown, uh, it would have made no difference at all. And radar is a big help when it comes to detecting tornadoes. A big help, but there's a big gap in how good it is also in that radar reads precipitation and there's sometimes a certain signature to a tornado. In this case, there was not. And in a lot of cases, there is not. And uh, there's been questions as to why radar didn't detect this tornado. A lot of times they don't. I think it's, uh, you know, everyone after a disaster of any type wants to find someone to blame. Uh, it's a natural tendency to feel outrage when you're, when you're hurt. Um, and someone's got to be at fault. Uh, I think it would be difficult to say that anyone was at fault in this case or, this, or that the equipment or the resources existed to have done any better. I think the really important thing to remember here is in the aftermath, the governmental officials, the volunteers, the people from all over the area came together extremely rapidly and they have done a magnificent job in recovery. I mean, given the, the scope of the devastation, you can drive through the streets now, even mm -hmm. Cumberland Avenue, which was, uh, which was very heavily damaged. They've the, done a terrific job in the cleanup. This is what I wanted to ask you about. Where, where does uh, the <coughs> community's resolve run out and the ability of the state uh, to come in and help uh, run out in, ter in terms of, in other words, where, where do those two uh, things meet? I know I was down there uh, on Monday night, early Tuesday morning, all night long, and it seemed like no one was in bed in Middlesbrough that night. Right. They were all up. They were all uh, trying to hmm. overcome this. Right. That's a tough question to answer, too. Um, adrenaline takes, and, and resolve takes you a long way. Uh, it would not be at all unusual to see people going pretty steadily for about three days. At that point, fatigue sets in. And of course, state agencies were in there from the very outset. The State Department of Transportation was in helping with debris removal. The state police were in there that night with security. The Kentucky National Guard was in there within five hours helping with security and other agencies as well. And, and they, they do have resources to bring in other people. But the people in the community are the ones who just aren't going to go to sleep. And at some point, whether it's the third day or the fourth day, they're physically exhausted, they're mentally exhausted, they get angry, uh, they get frustrated, <laughs> they want it to go away, mm -hmm. and it doesn't go away. And, and that's where you see some conflicts that really probably would not occur if, if there was, if they were more detached, if they were not involved in it, but that's not human nature. Right. How difficult is it uh, for you to coordinate all of this, all of these state agencies, get them involved, uh, get them uh, moving immediately? What's your first action when you hear Fra it? Well, frankly, it, it has not been very difficult at all because uh, state agencies have a plan. Uh, we exercise the plan. We just had a major exercise uh, in April. We have coordinators assigned from each major state government agency that have the authority to move the assets to that agency. So generally, one phone call will get the results. And, and each governor, since I've been in this for the last 13 years, has made this a priority with his, his or her cabinet officials. And uh, the response of state agencies is the, is the least difficult aspect. Getting the state and local officials together sometimes is difficult, but it hasn't been this time. Uh, 
when it's more widespread, like a flood where you've got maybe five to 20 counties, it becomes more difficult. But this one has been pretty easy to get people together. All right. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. We're going to talk more about the fact that now Middlesboro has been declared a disaster area. We'll find out what that means and what's ahead when we come right back. Welcome right back to Heart of the Matter as we talk about disaster, how communities handle them, and the fact that now Middlesboro has been declared a disaster area after a terrible tornado. And uh, one of the things, Tom, that uh, struck me that uh, down there that day, two things people wanted immediately. They wanted that storm to be called a tornado, and they wanted to see their governor. And uh, early in the morning, uh, it was believed that, uh, you know, he would come uh, somewhere in a helicopter at some point that day. In fact, he did come later. They were a bit disappointed, I think, when he originally said that he didn't think it was a disaster area fitting for federal funds. And then uh, he went back and, uh, and re-declared that that area was that. Uh, in, the, in the scope of all of that, uh, tell me what was going on at the DES. What was going on, do you think, in the governor's mind? Well, I think uh, what we have here some confusion and some misunderstanding of what was happening. Uh, first, we have a new administration that's never experienced a disaster before. Um, and there was some misunderstanding of terminology as well. The issue of whether it's a tornado or a storm always happens. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. Right. But some people think that you only get federal assistance if it's a tornado. So they want to see it called a tornado. The after effect is what's important. On the, when the governor came to visit, of course, some initial surveys have been made, uh, what we call windshield surveys. You go around and count buildings and, and give an estimate of how badly they're damaged. And the governor had the results of that. And at that point, our indication was that very probably, based upon the insurance that we would have anticipated, that the disaster might not qualify for a presidential disaster declaration. Now, there's a general perception that if the president doesn't declare it, that means no federal aid can be available. And that's not true. Uh, in, and in fact, what the governor was trying to convey in his initial briefing was that while it may not qualify for f full federal assistance from the president, there are still some things that we're going to be looking at in terms of federal aid, perhaps from the Small Business Administration, which is the most likely source, from the Farmers Home Administration, from, from other federal agencies, Department of Education, and so on. Uh, and, and we were looking at all of those agencies at that time in concert with our, our uh, uh, legislators. But obviously there was an outcry because the public felt that, that state government, which translated to the governor, didn't understand that this was a disaster. No one's ever disputed that it was a disaster. If you have one person whose home was wiped out, it's a disaster. And uh, I think there was a, a terminology problem there. Uh, and in fact, when, when it was obvious that the, there was this misunderstanding, the governor wanted to make sure everyone did understand the concern uh, the efforts that were ongoing, so he made another trip down there with, with a number of his cabinet members, a number of his top officials to reassure the people that, that anything that could be sought would be sought, and, and that effort's going on. This weekend, a federal team has been in here uh, to look at it. The senior official there is probably the most experienced federal official in the United States in disaster response, and I think with very shortly uh, we will have an answer to the governor's request. And I think it's also important to remember that even if the president does not declare this a federal disaster area, that does not preclude the ability to bring in other types of federal aid. What's ahead now for a community like that? Uh, you and the governor have been writing letters to the president, and uh, so what, what's going to happen now? If the president should declare a disaster area, then a large number of people will come in and set up what we call a disaster application center and all the people who are affected will be able to go in and, and identify what they lost, what they have in insurance, what their needs are and so on and that will be processed and whatever they're eligible for they'll get. Um, if it is not declared then it will be done more of an agency by agency basis and the Small Business Administration for example might come in and set up a similar center for, for businesses and individuals. If nothing is declared by some chance, and we certainly hope that would not occur, uh, it gets to be principally an insurance issue and some assistance from state agencies through existing programs, uh, assistance from the Red Cross, Salvation Army, other volunteer groups that have been in there, the Kentucky Council of Churches, uh, 
and, and other similar groups. And it's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And it'll take a long time for Middlesboro to, to resemble what they would like for it to resemble again. So whether or not uh, an area uh, qualifies for uh, disaster funds uh, has something to do with how much uh, insurance is on some of those buildings and structures? Absolutely. The, the decision is ultimately based upon the amount of loss minus the amount that is insured because the intent of federal aid is to meet those unmet needs. It's not to duplicate assistance. And for example, aid that is provided to the Red Cross would not be duplicated by the federal government if they provided money for temporary housing or for, or for repairs or for replacement of household goods. They would not also get money. And I think it's also important to remember that if any declaration like this would mean that the state and federal government is going to bear 25% of the cost of it. All right. It just so happens that this time it, it was Middlesboro, yes. that uh, we have uh, communities strewn across this state. Uh, how prepared are other cities for this, and uh, are, they, are they ready? Are they dependent on the DES uh, beyond the point of reason? Uh, should the cities be more prepared themselves? Some communities are very well prepared. Uh, some have been working at this for a long time and they have professional people who work in this every day and they have committed local governments. Some are pitifully prepared, uh, quite candidly. Some could not begin to care for themselves if they were hit by uh, an event of this magnitude. And there's no trend. You can't say that Louisville's prepared and the smallest community is not, uh, when in fact there are some small communities. Uh, uh, Fulton County in western Kentucky, for example, is very small. They're extraordinarily well prepared. Uh, Rowan County is doing a terrific job. Uh, uh, there's been a great deal of improvement in, recent, in the recent months, even in Fayette County, where we've seen some restructuring of governmental services, some testing of warning systems for the first time. I think people are becoming more and more aware every year of the need to be prepared, but as everything else, it costs money and it costs new money in many cases. Governments are seeing a dwindling of existing money and, and it's a matter of priorities. It's tough to tell your community, we're gonna go out and spend some money for warning systems, we're gonna spend money for a new emergency plan or to test this plan when they're looking at potholes mm -hmm. because that's, people want their roads fixed, they want their schools better and they, to be prepared for an emergency is simply an insurance Tough policy. Priority. The recent tornado in Middlesbrough has brought a lot of, of public awareness about tornadoes and how it can uh, affect a community and also the possibilities of it hitting a mountainous area. Now with me is Jeff Noble, of course, the WYMT weatherman. Jeff, uh, you have some tips and maybe some precautions that people might be uh, might want to jot down and, and take note of. We do, Tony. First of all, let's remind people that we are in the tornado season right now. It starts from around mid-March and usually ends till about mid-June in the Ohio Valley to which the mountains are in, which includes Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia. So we're still very much in the twister season also for severe storms. Second, there has been this myth about tornadoes not striking the mountains because they're, they're so high. Mm -hmm. But again, as we saw a couple of weeks ago in Middlesboro, that is all very false. And yes, they can strike uh -huh. anywhere and dip down underneath and cause lots of damage. Now, are there certain tips or precautions that someone should take uh, in order, I mean, beforehand, before a tornado right. strikes? Among the first things we can talk about, the tornado watch means the conditions are right for a tornado to develop. And the first thing you should do is to plan your action and also secure property when you hear the tornado watch. A tornado warning means that a tornado has been sighted. The best thing to do when you hear that is to seek shelter immediately. What you can do, in fact, maybe in the next couple of days is to plan carefully about what to do in case of a storm. One of the things is to identify the best shelters in your area. Also keep a detailed report, rather a detailed inventory of possessions in a safe place outside the home, like a safe deposit mm -hmm. box. Make sure your family, and this is also true anytime, like in, uh, in say, of a, a fire, but especially because of a severe storm, make sure your family knows correct safety procedures. You never can tell. And also be sure to assemble an emergency storm kit. Now, if a watch is issued, the first thing to re keep in mind is to prepare. Keep your radio or your TV, or if you have a weather radio, keep those tuned for weather reports at all times. Be alert for changes in the weather outdoors. That's very important. Also, put vehicles in a garage or carport if you have one, and put items like yard furniture indoors. And then finally, be prepared to move to a safe shelter in case a warning is issued. The next thing coming up, of course, if a tornado warning is issued, seek shelter immediately. A basement, of course, is the safest place to be. If there's no basement, seek an interior room on the lower floor of a reinforced building. 
Be sure to stay away from windows, exterior walls, and large open rooms because with all the winds blowing and all the, the pieces of furniture and glass flying through, you could get hurt pretty bad. Keep out of cars, trucks, and mobile homes. That is the worst place to be when a tornado strikes because simply they get a lot of damage. If you're outside, lie in a ditch or other low area. Be sure to cover your neck and head. And be sure if you're outside to be alert for flash flooding because oftentimes tornadoes do strike when there is like heavy rain, hail, and of course damaging winds as well. And there is some flash flooding involved. Finally, keep a transistor radio tuned in for weather reports to your local radio station because oftentimes they do stay on the air mm -hmm. throughout the evening to give you immediate reports, especially in your local area. Now, after the storm, the best thing you can do is to stay calm. Check utility lines and appliances for damage. Also, be sure to turn off the gas if you are heated or cooked with gas. If you have any question about safety, turn off the gas. Should you have homeowner's insurance or if your car or truck is damaged by the storm, uh, contact your agent. Be sure to clean and dry furnishings. Prevent further damage from happening. Make immediate temporary repairs and try to salvage what you can. Don't rush into repair contracts. We've heard that in Middlesbrough yeah. they're asking people right now to watch out for shady operators. Deal with reputable contractors in your area that you know and trust. And then finally, if you have homeowner's insurance, be sure to keep receipts for temporary living expenses if you have to stay at a motel or also eat in restaurants and things like that. One last note, Tony. Tornadoes usually strike between 3 and 7 p.m in the late afternoon and early evening hours, but again, they can strike anywhere, and of course, the one that happened in Middlesbrough struck between 10 and 10.30, so yeah, well, it can happen you, anytime. As you mentioned before, oftentimes we seem that we feel as though we're protected, but th that's not that's the case. That's true. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Now, while some questions are still being answered, the citizens of Middlesbrough will be trying to put back the pieces of their city. How to turn a negative into a positive. That will be the task of Middlesbrough officials. Can a disaster of this magnitude spark a rejuvenation of the community? Or will its effects be felt for years ahead? It's a beautiful valley, big wide streets. Uh, the, the growth potential is outstanding. I see problems right now immediately, but in the long range plans, I see Middlesbrough coming back to be better than ever before. It'll really get the spirit up in Middlesbrough. I really think it will. Because these people are... Uh, they were, they were beginning to be on their way back anyhow, so, so it'll bring the spirits. spirits. Uh, Middlesbrough will come back uh, better than ever. We'll have newer, newer buildings. We'll have uh, more money being coming into the community from grants and other kinds of assistance. And I think the resiliency of the people's spirit will ultimately be uh, shown in a more progressive, dynamic area here. As businesses try to put back their belongings, attention will be focused on the downtown area of Middlesbrough. We've heard a lot of rumors that some of the businesses won't reopen. I, I hope that that's not the case. The city needs these downtown businesses to make it a total complete package for the city, not just the developments in the other parts of town. We are trying to create an incentive for property owners or new property owners, people that have not had the means to do with what they'd like to do in downtown and creating some new businesses and some new jobs. It's just according to how long it takes the existing property owners to clear that property that is condemned and, and uh, rebuild new buildings. And I think that downtown Middlesbrough has a potential of becoming the beautiful downtown city and, and, and a large metropolis uh, that, that it should be. The tornado in Middlesbrough was indeed a shock. While the tragedy will linger in many minds, the disaster has certainly made eastern Kentuckians aware of the hazards of high winds and a tornado. The dollar figure for damages in the Bell County town are still climbing and will reach into the millions. Yet the town of Middlesbrough is on the way to recovery. This is Tony Turner for 57 Mountain News.